All right, welcome to church this morning. We're glad that you're here. If you are outside, why don't you make your way on inside and we'll get started this morning. Uh, a few things to be in prayer for. Continue to pray for Sister Rose. Uh, she's come to the surgery doing okay. Uh, a few more things going on with some tests this week, so just be in prayer for her. Uh, be in prayer for the Lama family and Brother Mike. Um, he's out of the hospital, but he's waiting the results of the biopsy um, from the brain lesion, and so I uh, do be in prayer for them. Um, and be in prayer for Tommy. He's not able to be here this morning. He will yesterday get a high fever, and so the boys is home with her. So uh, we have Katie on the piano this morning, so we'll, we'll keep going and uh, just sing along, and, and we'll have a good time in service together. I think. Okay, I'm going to have a good time in church. I don't care if you think church is a place where you've got to go back at me. I'll still have a good time. All right? So let's open up the service in a word of prayer. And then Messiah will come and he'll lead us in some songs this morning. Father, thank you so much for this day. We thank you for this time that you've given us together. Uh, we pray for uh, those in the church who are going through some different things and uh, through some different testings, Lord, we pray that you continue to be with Sister Rose and the Espinosa family. <coughs> pray to be with Brother Mike and his family. Pray to be with Tommy, help him be feeling better. And I know there's probably a few others out there who are unwell or, or going through some different things. Pray to be with them. Pray to be in the service this morning. Uh, may we learn about you, may we grow closer to you. But Lord, most of all, we pray that you be lifted up and glorified. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs> second and the fourth verses.
continue on and go of course uh, in that plague uh, they were challenged Pharaoh was challenged to let the people of Israel go and he said no now here's going to be an interesting thing we're going to find as we keep going because the next plague was on the cattle and on the animals and it killed a number of them and but the interesting thing that happened remember within Egypt there was one particular city that was given to Joseph and his descendants, right? Everybody remember that? Remember that it was in the city of Goshen. Now, all of these plagues were taking place everywhere in Egypt except Goshen. So the children of Israel did not have to suffer any of these plagues. So when all the cattle died, the children of Israel's cattle were fine. Can you imagine how that would be when the Egyptians were looking on going, why are we going through this, but yet there's nothing going on there? Well, after all these cattle dying, Aaron and, and Moses went back and asked to let the people of Israel go. And of course, Pharaoh said, no. Right? He said, no. And so he said, okay, well, there's going to be another plague. And that other plague, they were they given boils all over their skin. If you've never had a boil, if you've never had anyone, you know, if you've ever had a skin infection or a rash or, you know, those little pussy things that you get, you know, sometimes. Can you imagine your body being covered in those? It'd be very uncomfortable. And so some time went by and uh, he was sort of thinking about it, you know, you might think about it now and then. They came back and said, let the children of Israel go. And he said, no. And they said, okay, well, if you're still not going to let the children of Israel go, uh, there's going to be more plagues. And so sure enough, the next plague that came was hail. Now, we've been in, if you've lived in Brisbane at the time, you've been in some hailstorms, right? Uh, but this hail was a really bad hailstorm. And it did a lot of damage and killed a lot of things and and so, of course, that, that was going on, and when that was uh, subsided, they came back and said, if you want the plagues to stop, you need to let the children of Israel go. Can you imagine going through all of this and still questioning whether God was serious? But how often do we see things happen in our life and we still, I don't know, you know. Is that of God or is that not of God? But So before we get too much on oh, Pharaoh, how dumb could he be? We can do the same thing, can't we? And so they said, no. He said, okay, well, there's going to be another plague. And they sent in the locusts. God sent in the locusts. And the whole place was covered in locusts. Now, it's not like grasshoppers, but locusts are. Have you ever seen them? They're big. Can you imagine? They're loud. And they start making the noise. They start flying around and all this type of thing. And so... If there was locusts everywhere, what do you think came of their crops and all those the vegetation? They would just maybe we could get some of those and we wouldn't have to mow as much. I don't know, I don't know that, that probably wouldn't be good because they, they're indiscriminate, they eat everything. And of course they came back and said, and you'll let the supervision go. And he said, No, I'm not gonna do it. And he said, Okay, we're gonna send another plague. And the ninth plague, the whole land went dark. It all went dark. Matter of fact, the Bible, if you read it, says it was so dark you probably you couldn't even see the hand in front of your face. Have you ever been in the dark, that dark? You know it would be really weird if you lived, you know, 
in Goshen, it wasn't dark. Can you imagine living in Goshen where it was all light and you looked outside of Goshen and it was all dark in the middle of the day? I Bob doesn't say this, but you know, I'm the type of person to be kind of like, light, dark, light, dark. I probably wouldn't recommend doing that. Uh, because, you know, this side was being judged by God, this side wasn't, so let's not do that. Uh, but that's probably why I'm alive today, not then, okay? I get myself in trouble with too many things. And, of course, they came back, and he had thought about letting them go, but then he eventually said, no, not going to happen. So they came back, and they said, all right, the last one is this. If you do not let the children of Israel go, the firstborn male of every family in Egypt will die. But the children of Israel were told there is only one way to avoid that, and that is that you have that lamb, and you eat that lamb all that night, which is where the Passover came from. And you take the blood from that lamb and put it on your, on your posts and above your door, because that night the death angel would pass over. And they would eat that meal and, and not leave anything around. Why? Because they, God told them they were going to be leaving. So sure enough, that, that came. And, and in that night, there was great weeping all throughout that night and then the next day throughout Egypt because the firstborn male of every family died. And Moses and Aaron came back and talked to Pharaoh and Finally, Pharaoh said, just go. Just, just get out of here. And after going through all of this, as the children of Israel were packing up and leaving, the Egyptians were giving them gifts on their way out. They were gifting them all these, this gold and all these different things. And by the way, God, they, God would use some of that stuff later on, and they would use some of that stuff later on for not so good things. Um, but... Uh, they off they went, and they were finally free, and they were on their way to the promised land. And then they got to the Red Sea. And have you ever had second thoughts? You ever did something and had second thoughts about it? Well, if you come back next week, we're going to find out Pharaoh had second thoughts about letting his entire workforce go. And so if you want to find out what happens next, you need to come back next week and we'll learn more about Moses and the children of Israel in our uh, story time. But at this time, uh, Brother Dieter will be, be coming and uh, in a few moments we'll have a scripture reading. So when he comes, if you have your Bibles open at Ephesians chapter 5, uh, we'll go from there. Right, get the exhaust. So, good morning, everybody. It's nice to see you all here. Just a, a quick reminder that the offering boxes are on the welcome tables, not that we, well, just to make up for us not, no, that's not the right words. I'm not quite sure what the right words are, but anyway, the offering boxes are, are there, and um, that's for your use um, as you. Oh, anyway, I'll leave it at that. Um, all right, our scripture reading is Ephesians chapter 5, and um, we're going to be reading from verse 15 to 21. All right, starting at verse 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is ex excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word.
one more time through the message. We'll be singing My Jesus I Love. We'll sing the first, the third, and the fourth verses of this one. chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, we'll continue on as we uh, study, if you do have your children that like to be in children's church this time, those that are under, four and under can go at this time, uh, but Ephesians chapter 5, as we continue to look at some things that will help on our Christian walk that not everyone sees, and so often they're, they're very ignored, they're uh, not very talked about or thought about, but Without the proper foundation in our Christian life, whatever we build upon that, we'll have some serious problems. Uh, we'll have some weaknesses. We'll have some uh, cause to crumble. And so today, we're going to be learning about another aspect of the Christian life that no one sees. Matter of fact, if I'm looking out at you and I'm looking at all these people who are seated here this morning, and if I'm honest with you, I have no idea if you are living a spirit, or you're doing spirit-filled living or not. I don't know. Matter of fact, someone could be sitting next to you, and you can be married to them. You can be related to them, and you may not know. You may have an inclination, but you don't know for sure. You say, why? Because this is something between an individual and God. And so, but it's one of those things that if you are having spirit-filled living, it'll be evident to those around you in several different ways. But can I say this? To be living, a, to be spirit-filled living goes against human nature. Why? Well, how often do you hear a young person when they get a little you know, the teen years, well, I can't wait till no one tell, can tell me what to do, and I can make my own choices, and I can live my own life. Ever heard that before, parents? Ever thought that before, young people? And if you're sitting here going, I've never thought that, you're a liar. Because we all have. It's part of the nature 
of mankind. We all kind of want to make our own choices and chart our own course and, and do those types of things. So spirit-filled living goes against that. Because spirit-filled living is saying, although I could make choices on my own, I am willingly yielding control of my life to someone else. In other words, I have this idea of what I would like to do with my life. But I'll never forget, I remember, the, if you're in year 12, the question I had when I was in year 12, I know that was a long, long time ago, that I absolutely hated was this. What are you going to do with your life? What do you want to do with your life? How many of you heard that quite a bit? What do you want to do with your life? Some of us are adults and we still have, what do you want to do with your life? I don't know, don't drink them out yet, right? It all changed one day. My pastor at the time, Pastor Wilkes, walks up to me, and I was walking down the hallway, and he stopped me. He said, Joe, I want to ask you a question. And I thought, oh, great. Here it comes again. I'm in year 12, and everybody and their brother wants to know what I want to do with my life. And here we go. My, and you say, did you say all this out loud? No. This was a conversation I had with me, myself, and I in my head. And I'm thinking, oh, brother, here goes my pastor. Going to ask you the question again. And out of clear blue, he stops and looks at me and says, What do you think God would have you do for him with your life? And I stopped. And I looked at him. And I said, Pastor, no one's ever asked me that before. Everybody wants to know what I want to do with my life. And he looked at me and he says, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but I don't care what you want. And I thought, well, this is an encouraging moment with my pastor. He said, I don't care what you want. I want to know, have you and God spent some time alone that you know what God would have you do with your life for him? Because that's all that's got to matter. You can do whatever you want with your life for you, and you've wasted your entire life because the only thing that will matter, the only thing that will last for eternity, is what you do with your life for him. And I remember going, you know, I'm going to have to think about that. that was, said, what was your answer? I'm going to have to think about that. He said, you, he said, good. If you had an answer like that, I'd wonder. He said, because most people, he said, even most adults I ask that question to have never thought about that. And I said, well, I'll think about that. Well, about a month later, I was walking in the hallway, and I hear out of my pastor's office, hey, Joe, come here. Walked in, I said, yes, Pastor, what can I do to help you? He said, have a seat. And I sat down. And he said, so have you thought about my question? What do you, what do you, what are you going to do with your life for God? What does God want you to be like for him? I remember having to give an answer for that. You see, that kind of goes against nature, doesn't it? To submit yourselves. And so that's what the spiritual living does. At the moment of salvation, I don't care what anyone else is going to teach you according to the Word of God. The moment of salvation, you are given the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes and it dwells you at that moment you accept Him as your Savior. But although we are given the Holy Spirit salvation and He will never leave us, we must make the decision, decision to surrender to Him on an ongoing daily basis. So when I use the phrase filled with the Holy Spirit, don't get out of your mind the idea of, well, I'm getting more of the Holy Spirit. No, you have all the Holy Spirit you're ever going to get. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, that means He has more of you than He's had before. In other words, there's more of your life of saying, Lord, I give you the control. I'm submitting more to you. And so as we look at this passage of Scripture, uh, it teaches us how it looks like to live on a daily basis a spirit-filled life. The very first thing I want to show you is the spirit-filled path. In the verse of 15 and 16, it says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. This is going to be a shocker, but spirit-filled living isn't accomplished in one moment and one decision. It's not like you said, well, I decided, you know, 25 years ago to yield myself to the Holy Spirit. Wonderful, but what about yesterday? Wonderful, but what about today? What about tomorrow? 
20 years ago doesn't matter today. Are you yielding to him today? The word walk here refers to the way that we conduct our daily living. It is referring to your lifestyle, the way you live. God wants you to walk in his spirit as opposed to walking in the flesh. You understand, spirit-filled living is always contrasted with carnal fleshly living. That, that's, you say, well, what do you know, how do you want to know what spirit filled living is? It's the opposite of living according to the flesh. And vice versa. The fruits, of the, by the way, if you remember right, if you study Galatians, when it gives you the fruit of the spirit, before it gives you the fruit of the spirit, what does it give you? The fruits of the flesh. And if you contrast them, they're direct opposites of each other. And so as we go on and we begin to look at this, it gives us two descriptions of a spirit-filled path. The very first thing it tells us is a spirit-filled path is a path of caution. A path of caution. It says that if you're on the spirit-filled path, you live your lives circumspectly. That ye walk circumspectly. That word we don't use often. I mean, in the course of a normal conversation, not many times have you heard someone say, well, let's be circumspect about that. Not often, is it? That word circumspectly, we get a word that we use a lot in mathematics called the circumference. Around the distance around something. The idea to walk circumspectly, it's a cautious path that you're aware of and on guard of all directions. Have you ever been like guarding and looking and, and watching one direction only to have someone stick up behind you and still scare you half out of your mind? You say, well, what's happening? You weren't being circumspect. You weren't being circumspect in your caution. You say, why? You were locked in in one direction, but you weren't keeping an eye out from every direction, all directions, all 360 degrees. Sort of reminds me of this. If you ever read a little bit about lions, lions are, I mean, really, if you look at them, um, not how they're in cartoons and movies and all that type of stuff, but just themselves, they're kind of beautiful creatures. Whether you're seeing, I mean, I've never seen one in the wild by myself, thankfully. Uh, I've seen them more in zoos or like on TV and things of that nature. But they're, they're really beautiful creatures. But if we knew, if you knew, if I were to say to you, when you leave church this morning and you walk out to your car in the car pack, park, somewhere between here and your car, you are going to encounter a lion today. How would you be when you were walking back to your car? First of all, would you walk back to your car? Second of all, would you say to me, Pastor, how do you know we're going to be seeing a lion? What have you done? But okay, putting those two things aside, would you be walking back to your car, not paying attention to anything, not looking at any bush, just kind of like, nah, 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 nah. or would you be on high alert if you actually trust that there was actual line between here and the car? I mean, you'd be kind of looking in every bush before you got there. You'd be very cautious in how you walked, right? Would you only be looking in front of you? But what? You know, you'd be looking all around you. I mean, if you're a family, you might say, okay, you look that way, and 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 we'll, we'll get there if we all check this out, right? That's being circumspect. Well, a lot, from what I've read, what I've seen, one of the lion's favorite meals is an antelope. Now, two things happen that help a lion as it hunts for its next meal if it's an antelope. They are incredibly good at hiding. And lions are phenomenally patient. They will sit there ready to pounce and just wait to the very right moment to get that antelope. But there's another advantage that the lion has when he hunts an antelope. Antelopes go physically fast. I'm sorry, but they are not mentally sharp and they do not learn from their mistakes. You say, what do you mean? Well, you can have a watering hole. 
And just about an hour ago, this group of antelope were at that watering hole, and a lion took one of the antelope. And they all scattered. And an hour later, guess where you'll find the same pack of antelopes? Back in the same watering hole. Completely oblivious to the fact of, there could still be lions there. And so one by one, a group of lions can pick off these antelope. All they got to do is sit there and wait, and eventually, dinner will come back. The next course will come and present itself, right back in the same watering hole. Why? Because they don't learn from their past mistakes, and they have a very short memory, and there's water there, and they're thirsty. Now, they may be fast. But well, think about this, if that was a lion who's patient and strong and kind of can predict that, hey, if I just hold tight, my next course will come and present itself to me. Who do you think has the advantage? The lion, right? Because the antelope are not circumspect and they're, they're looking. Can I tell you something? Is it any one of the devil is compared to a lion? He's extremely good at hiding. And he is phenomenally patient. The spirit-filled path, as a result of that, is a path of caution. We ought to always be on the lookout for the disguises of the enemy, for the traps that are lurking behind things that can be seemingly innocent. Because I can tell you this, he will not give up. And as much as smart as we think we are, we're not much smarter than the antelope. You say, what? The devil knows this. That besetting sin you have, give it a little while, you'll be back. Yes or no? I don't want to admit that. Well, I'm sorry. It's, it's, humans, we're kind of like antelope. We just kind of keep going back to the same thing. The devil goes, got to do it. Circumspectly. It's a pattern that way. It's also a path of consecration in verse 17. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. A spirit-filled living path is a path of consecration that consecrate literally means separating from a something that's common to a sacred use. It is the will of God that we should live consecrated, sanctified, set apart lives. If you ever read the writings of Oswald Chambers, he said this, a walk in the spirit will of necessity be a walk in accordance with the word that the Holy Spirit has inspired. No one can be filled with the spirit of God if, it's, if he is neglecting the word of God. You understand that? You what he's saying. If you're gonna walk in the spirit, you're gonna be in the word. If you say, well, I don't need to read the Bible, then I guarantee you something, you're not walking in the Spirit. Because this is the word that the Holy Spirit inspired. This is the instruction manual. And if you want to walk in the Spirit, you better be in the Word. You see, that is a path of, of consecration. The Spirit-filled path is completely different than the carnal path. It's a path of walking circumspectly, of staying away from danger. It's not a path of going, let's see how close to the edge I can get. It's a path, you know what? I'm going to stay. I'm going to stay away. Second thing we see about the spirit filled life is it's the spirit filled purpose in verse 18. It's an interesting verse, and I'm not going to be harping on, on the first half of it, but I want to use it as comparison because it's something we should understand. The Bible says, And be not drunk with wine, where is excess, but be filled with the spirit. The path of conscience and consecration has a purpose. It is not simply that we be kept from danger and free from sin. It is that way we be filled with and under the control of the Holy Spirit. So for that we see a determined purpose. A determined purpose. First half of that verse says, And be not drunk with wine. I can tell you something, if we are able to be under the control of the Spirit of God, we will have to disallow anything else that would bring us under its control. This command is not, uh, could not have been given to us more clearly than in this way. 
and B not drunk with wine. Where it is excess. Now, I mean, we could go on and debate everything about, about drinking alcohol and all those types of things. But if you look at the book of Proverbs sometime, let's take you by the book of Proverbs. Let's read a couple of verses here just to kind of lay some groundwork to be able to understand better what he's saying here. Proverbs chapter 23. We'll read verses 29 to verse 35. It says, who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath contentions, who hath battle, who hath wounds without cause, who hath redness of eyes, they that carry along at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last it biteth like a serpent, it stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thy heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea. Now that would be a good spot to take a nap, right? Uh, or he, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. Now think about this. If you're on a boat, are you going to lay down on top of the mast? Not very smart, right? Uh, they that have stricken me, shalt thou say, as I was not sick, they have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. You see, this gives us a lengthy explanation of the dangers of drunkenness and the tragic hold that alcohol can have on a person's life. It's just not a smart thing. It's not a good thing. You say, why? Because when you do that, you are yielding control of your life to something else. It's not a good thing. But here's the determined purpose, the, the, the contrast that, that he's giving with the Holy Spirit here. The command here against drunkenness is directed and to be taken at face value, but it's also used as a comparison. Just as a drunk person is under the control of alcohol, so the Christian is to be under the control of the Holy Spirit. You see, who you yield yourself to is who controls you. You yield yourself to, this is what the Bible's comparison here. Have you ever, I mean, growing up, I can remember a lot, a lot of people in my family would, would drink and, and a lot of people in my family were drunks. And that book of Proverbs, when someone drinks and they're controlled by alcohol, they say crazy things. They say pervert. They do dumb things. Would we all agree lying down in the middle of the ocean would be a dumb place to take a nap? I mean, we're not talking in a boat. We're just talking like you go in the middle of the ocean, jump off the boat, lay down, and take a nap, right? Pretty dumb place. The mast, the top of the ship, you know, that little thing that sticks up? That's probably not a good place to lay down either, is it? You'd say, man, someone who lays that up there is pretty dumb. All you got to do is get away and you go flying. <laughs> Equally, I have seen family members do silly, dumb things in that way. I've seen them get sick and then roll over and lay and go to sleep there. I don't know about you, but I've never thought of let me throw up in bed, roll over, lie in it all night and go for a nap. This dumb stuff. Why? They yielded control to the substance. Now, it could be alcohol, it could be drugs, it could be a number of things. Uh, there's people who are controlled by, by greed. There's people who are controlled by a workaholic and yeah, I've got to go to work and I've got to go to work and they're controlled by that. There are people who are controlled by, you know, money. So we're not just saying just this one thing, but we're using it as an example because that's what the Bible uses as an example, the contrast to compare. And what he's saying is, hey, just like being controlled by alcohol can destroy your life and cause you to do some bad things, being controlled by the Holy Spirit will never result that way. It will always result. And so we have to have a dedicated purpose. So even as alcohol takes control of the mind and the body, affecting that person's behavior and conversation, so the same will happen to a person who's under control of the Holy Spirit. It'll affect you. It'll change you. It'll change how you talk. It'll change how you carry yourself. So not only is it a determined purpose, but it's a yielded purpose. Verse 18, it says, 
but be filled with the Spirit. That word filled means to make full, to fill to the full, to cause to abound, to furnish or supply liberally. Just as the contrast is made of choosing to be under the influence of alcohol, it's also a choice to be filled with the Spirit of God. It is a position to which one must yield. When a Christian is fully under the control of the Holy Spirit, then he will be fully first and supplied with all that is needed to live out the work of God in his life. The key is obeying the commandment to be filled. To be filled is to yield to the Spirit so that way he may have control of our lives and our will. Think about this. What was it when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane? And he was praying, Father, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. What was he doing there? Let's be honest, think about this. For as an example to us, he was yielding control to the Father. Father, this is, this, humanly speaking, this is not something I want to do, but it's not about me. It's about you controlling and doing what pleases you and doing the will that you have put me here for. That's what it means to be yielded. Being filled with the Spirit is not something we do, but something that is done for us. We don't pour the power of the Spirit into our lives. We simply surrender our wills and that and that yielding to Him to work into our lives. In other words, uh, we repent of sins. We can be emptied of self. We can yield to the Holy Spirit. But it is God who fills us. We are filled, we are blessed with a great liberty. When we give God's Spirit free reign in our lives, His power works in and through us. My, why is it, it seems that some people are able to do greater things for God than others. Why is it some people have all these wonderful stories about being able to lead this person to the Lord, or that person to the Lord, this person to the Lord? I'll tell you what the difference is. They made a choice that morning, and that moment, to yield to the Holy Spirit. That's why. Are they some super spiritual people? No, guess what? They're just like you and me. I have the privilege to be around some people that a lot of people think, oh, there's, these people are... Uh, our pillars and, and their generation all that kind of stuff. You know what I found out? They're just like you and just like me. Every day they've got to make the same choice that you and I have to make. And when they don't, <laughs> they fall flat on their face just like we do. It happens. I remember the, the I remember the first time I always, you know, growing up, I always looked up to my pastor and I thought, man, man he's He's a spiritual giant and all these type of things. And the first time we, my mom watched their kids and they were leaving the next morning, early in the morning, to go on a family holiday. And I remember, I don't know, this is, you remember weird things? Yeah, you know, just weird pictures in your mind? And I remember, I was, forget where I was, but I was in the living room or somewhere of his house. And he walks out of his bedroom. And I went, who did the jobs? And I looked at him. And he looks at me and smiles and goes, welcome to the club. I said, what's that? He says, you see me in my, you've seen me in my pajamas. And I'm like, there's a club? And he's like, yeah, because guess what you found out? What's this? And he said, I'm human. And I'm like, huh? I'm human. Just like everybody else. When you go to sleep, we get pajamas. I went, no. Yeah. And he goes, guess what? I've got to put him on one leg at a time, too. <laughs> and if I don't do it right, I fall flat on my face, just like you. And I went, no. And he went, yeah. And I may be you know, joking around about that, but I'm serious. That was a big learning moment for me. You know what I learned? Who's you and me? Just like everybody else. He, you know, weird things. You say, why? Because, you know, I had never seen my pastor outside of a suit. And I remember the first time we had 
Holiday Kids Club. It was going to be cowboys and Indians. You say, why did you go? Because you wanted to learn from the Bible? No. Pastor said he was going to come in a pair of blue jeans. And I had never seen him in anything but a suit. And I remember him saying, why did you go to Holiday Kids Club? Like, no. I went there because my pastor was going to be in a pair of blue jeans. And I was going to see that. And he came in and he looked right at me and he said, good enough for you? Now what? And he goes, guess what? What? He said, come here. So I walk up to him. Do me a favor. I said, what's that? He goes, pinch my arm. He said, you had a weird past. I, I had fun past. Like, yeah, I really did. And he said, pinch my arm. And I'm like, I can't pinch you. My mom will get kill me. She has to be with me. I told you to do it. He goes, pitch it hard. He goes, pitch it and twist. He goes, ah! And I said, what was that? He goes, it hurts too. And he said, guess what? No matter what, you're going to walk with God, you must make a choice every day, just like everybody else. He says it's a weird way to learn a lesson. I remember some weird lessons I've learned. But sometimes it's those weird things that cause them to sink in your brain. Third thing we see is the spirit filled with product. What does this produce in our life? Look at verses 19 to verse uh, 21. Speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Well, the very first product is this living a spirit filled life produces joy. Joy. A, a spirit-filled person is a person who's experienced the joy of the Lord. This is the kind of person who people like to be around because their joy permeates their countenance, their actions, and their words. And by the way, this is the type of person, the spirit-filled person, is the type of person that their joy is not connected to their circumstances. Their joy is connected to their relationship with God. You see, biblical joy has nothing to do with what's going on around you. Biblical joy has nothing to do with everything in your life that's going good. Some of the most joyous people I've ever met in my life have been going through the most horrible things in their life. But because of their connection of their relation, because they chose that day, no matter what they were going through, to be spiritual. One of the, one of the most joyous people I've ever met in my life is Mrs. York. Her, her husband was on the pastoral staff of our church, and uh, she went through brain cancer in a really bad bottle, and she ended up passing away to it. But I'll never forget, she always had a smile on her face. I remember as a teenager saying, Mrs. York, why are you always so happy? Like, you're in a lot of pain. Yeah, I'm in a lot of pain. You know you're dying. Yeah, I know I'm dying. Are you scared? She said, no, no. So why are you always so happy? He said, because it doesn't matter what's going on to me. What matters is I'm in Christ. And you know what? One day, this doesn't matter anymore. One day, it'll all be good, and I'll, I'll be fine, and I'll be healed, and I'll be happy, and I'll be in the presence of my Savior, and I'll be having a good time. And I said to her, sounds fun. And she said, so why wouldn't I be joyful here because I know it's coming? And I said, yeah, but how can you be so happy like in telling everyone about the Lord? Said, because I don't have long left and I know I've got to make a difference while I can. And if I know it's such a great thing that I'm going to, why don't I think everyone else should? <laughs> and I remember she said to me, you have to know it. And I said, but what if someone gets mad at you if you're witnessing them? She said, what are they going to do, kill me? I looked at her and I said, well, that's a good said, I'm dying anyway. What does it matter if they kill me? And I'm like, yeah, weird thing. Don't worry about it. Live your life with God. It'll be good. And I remember that. It produces joy. Second thing it produces in verse 20. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, if you're living the spirit for life, it produces gratitude. Gratitude. Another manifestation of someone filled with the Spirit is that they are a grateful person. They're thankful. 
The spirit of Christian will give thanks always for all things, no exceptions. You say, but, but how can we be thankful for the, for the bad services in life? Hey, it's better than the alternative, right? Hey, no matter how bad things get in this life, I can be grateful for this. I am not going to hell. I'm in Christ. It produces gratitude. It produces thankfulness. Giving thanks always for all things. Well, no, no, I'm just going to be thankful for the things I like. That's not all things. Be thankful for all things. And look at verse 21. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. And here's where the last thing I see that it will produce. It will produce a cooperation. Everyone likes to be around cooperative people, don't they? Everyone likes a team player. But not everyone likes to be cooperative. You notice that one? Everyone likes to be around a team player, but not everyone likes to be a team player. The spirit-filled Christian is willing to take the position of a servant. Mark chapter 10 and verse 45, if you look at it sometimes, it says that Jesus came not to be served, but to serve, to minister. You understand, a spirit-filled Part of being a spirit-filled Christian, walking in the spirit, yielding every day, is this, this willingness to serve, this willingness to cooperate, this willingness to, to work together. And ask you this morning, do you have a spirit of cooperation in your relationships? The spirit-filled Christian is a humble Christian. Look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, it says, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. By the way, you notice we stopped there and we didn't read verse 21? A lot, of people, a lot of people like to harp on verse 21, don't they? Wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands, your own husband, as unto the Lord, right? Well, how many of us have forgotten the fact that before wives are commanded to submit themselves to their husbands, all Christians were commanded to submit themselves one to another? The spirit of Christians' fear of God is displayed by cooperatively working alongside others. All of us would love these products of the spirit-filled life to fill our lives. Joy, gratitude, cooperation. And tell this morning, they can. We must simply yield our way to God. You know what, Lord? <clears throat> I yield to you. You have to fill A Christian who will survive life's storms must have a continual filling of the Holy Spirit below the baseline where no one else can see. This is not just a once for all decision. It is a continual surrender and a continual yielding. Hey, you woke up this morning. Did you yield to the Lord? You say, Yeah, I yield to the Lord. Guess what's going to happen? Some point today, you're going to have to yield again. Don't believe me? Get in your car, let someone cut you off. Mm -hmm. What happens? What are you going to do? Yield. What about tomorrow? When you wake up tomorrow, what do you have to do? You want to look filled with a spirit filled life. You know what? You know what I said? Father, I yield to you today. Multiple times a day. And it's the only way to really experience all that God has intended for you in the Christian life. You know how Jesus came to you life more abundant? You want that abundant life? Have you yielded yourself to the Lord each and every day? Father, we come before you this morning. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning and the challenge it is. And I know that the challenges in my own life. Lord, I pray that all those here today that do know you as their Savior, Lord, may we realize that just because we may have yielded our life to you at one point, sometime in our life, doesn't mean that we're living a yielded life. Lord, may we submit control of our lives to you so that we please and honor you in everything that we say and everything that we do. We allow your Holy Spirit to produce these things in our lives. And Lord, 
uh, maybe not be so stuck and on reliant on the circumstances of life to bring joy and happiness and peace and all these things, but we may be relying on you who can produce these things no matter what is going on and what we're going through in life. Lord, if there be anyone here today who has not really submitted their lives to you, they've not accepted you as your Savior. Or may today they stop and get that settled in Christ's name, we pray. Well, as we close the service this morning, if I can be helped in any way, I'll be available after the service. If you're here today, you're no Christ or Savior you'd like to, we'd be glad to come by and show you how you can do that before. If there's anything else, we'd be helped to you. We'd be more than happy to do that. A couple of things to remind you of as we leave. Um, on the back table, there are there is one bound of 500 um, invitations to church, gospel invitations. If you'd like to, you can grab that, let it your area. Uh, we're getting we're getting up there. We're getting through that first three month period where we challenge every family every three months to do uh, 500 homes. And so, if you want to jump in, you've got a few more days to hit your first quarter of 500, and then we'll go from there. Also, the ladies' retreat, April 13th through the 15th. Um, that is going ahead fully. Uh, we were just, uh, we only had about seven ladies, I think, registered for that so far. Um, but if you haven't registered, but you still want to come, there's still plenty of room. Uh, they've waived the 30 minimum, so we can still use the same facilities. And uh, we have everything ready to go um, up there. And so even if you aren't able to come for all of Tuesday and all of Wednesday and all of Thursday, but if you just want to come up Tuesday afternoon, come on up for the day. If you just want to come up Wednesday and spend Wednesday, let us know. Let my wife know. Uh, we'll work out a, a costing for what you know the food, the park you can be there. You don't have to be there the whole time. It's only about an hour and twenty minute drive there and back. It's no different than if you went to the Gold Coast, all right? And it's it'll be a good day for you. Um, but let me challenge you to be able to, to come on out and uh, be a part of that. And then we look forward to what God is going to do there. So we look forward to seeing you back tonight, five o'clock, right here for our evening service. Uh, we may be dismissed.